Okay, so uh, thank you for coming for my talk uh, about uh, shape shifting, creating uh, the delightful icon animations. Um, I'm, my name is Orbar. I work at Tumblr. Um, if you don't know, we're kind of a microblogging website uh, centered around uh, communities, centered around interests rather than kind of people you know. Um, anyway, I'm here to talk about um, what kind of got me uh, fascinated with icon animations in the first place. Uh, so right around the time I graduated from university uh, and I was kind of trying to teach myself Android. Um, and this was around the time where Jelly Bean was the kind of uh, the latest and greatest uh, new thing. And as I was trying to wrap my head around the uh, fragment life cycle and all that kind of the new stuff and the difficult stuff, um, more advanced apps and more experienced uh, developers started kind of introducing new navigation drawers and new uh, kind of uh, elements that weren't really in the framework. And uh, at some time later, uh, Google started, um, Google apps started introducing their own naviga navigation drawers and they had kind of various different implementations, but one of them came with this kind of cool animation that let you know when the menu was open or closed. Uh, and it was kind of informative, but it wasn't really a mind-blowing animation. Uh, and then they introduced uh, the standard uh, navigation drawer, and it came with this awesome animation. Um, and I kind of had to know how it was done. So I dug into it, I opened the action bar, action bar drawer toggle, and I looked at the code and I tried to figure it out, and it turned out there was no magic framework key um, work involved. It was just a bunch of uh, figuring out how far along in the animation you are and drawing it to the canvas. So I closed the file and I figured I'll never have the time to actually implement something like this for myself. And then the Timely app came out. Uh, and for those that don't know, Timely is a clock app uh, that does all the basic things you'd expect, like alarms, timers, stopwatches, uh, et cetera. But it had a shitload of animations. Uh, and there were numbers that morphed, and there were lines that changed size and color, and there were bubbles that moved for no apparent reason. Uh, and it was just like an eye-popping extravaganza of motion. And I literally spent hours staring at it. And, and again, I needed to know how they did it. So I Googled around, and I found this great article about uh, number twinning. And it explained, and it went into detail about how the numbers are not really fonts, but rather they are paths that are being drawn directly to the canvas, and there are control points, and there are extra control points that didn't really make sense. And it was complicated, and it was very interesting, but ultimately it was very complex. And it's not something that the average developer would figure out in a day or two. Uh, but by digging into this, I realized that these small animations are what actually kept, kept, uh, kept me coming back to these app. Uh, and I learned that icons can be more than just icons. An icon can be more than the sum of its parts. Uh, it can be informative, it can let you know uh, what will happen if you click it. Uh, it can convey information like, hey, there's more new stuff if you click me. Uh, and it doesn't really have to be complicated. Uh, we've all seen examples of this. It can be as simple as a red heart that lets you know um, that you've liked a post or an image. Uh, it can be a badge that lets you know uh, that you have new messages. Or it can be complex, like this animation from the Robin Hood app, uh, that lets you know uh, whether uh, scanning your fingerprint uh, failed or succeeded. Uh, this like fail animation that turns into an exclamation mark is just fantastic use of uh, a login screen. Uh, and the success that kind of blows up this image uh, and fades into the main trading screen is just incredible use of space. Um, so how do we actually build these cool animations uh, to use in our own apps? Well, first we need to understand what vectors and SVGs are. So SVG, or the Scalable Vector Graphic, is an image file format that's optimized first and foremost for a small file size. Uh, so that results in much smaller files than the equivalent PNG or JPEG. SVGs are also scalable, uh, meaning that a single SVG file won't lose, um, won't lose quality as you display it on a larger screen. 
Uh, and this is especially important for Android or other mobile uh, applications since it means you can only sh you you have the ability to ship one file uh, and display various sizes rather than shipping multiple copies of the same image for different screen resolutions. And then the best benefit of SVG is that you can animate uh, individual components of the image at runtime. So this is what an SVG file actually looks like. Uh, and as you can tell, it's clearly not a very friendly format uh, for us humans. But as Android developers, we know how to read XMLs. Uh, so you can pick out that there's an SVG element and some of its attributes. Uh, for example, there's a, a G element that appears to have a hex color value. But ultimately, it's not clear at all what shape is going to be displayed. Uh, so let's dig into the important parts. Uh, so the SVG format uh, uses a, a basic Cartesian coordinate system with the top left corner being 0, 0. Uh, it also supports transformations, uh, some of them as simple as rotation, scale, and translation, but also as complex as skewing. Uh, and although these are very cool, they're not all that useful uh, for simple icons. And then there's the view box element, uh, attribute. Uh, and that attribute defines the, uh, it defines the, the user space that will stretch to the bounds of your final container. And what that means is that whatever you did with the uh, base coordinate system, completely forget about that and just use a basic XY uh, coordinate system for the rest of the elements. So for example, you can uh, define, given whatever size, you can define a view box that's four pixels by four pixels, or four by four, it's not really pixels, uh, or 12 by 12, or a 48 by 48 grid. Um, and that's kind of how you define your grid. And now that you actually want to draw something, uh, SVG gives you many, many different options, many inst uh, instructions you can give it. Uh, but the most important and the most useful one, in my uh, opinion, is path. Uh, path represents the outline of the shape you want to draw. Uh, and that path can be uh, filled, stroked, or used to clip other paths in the same image. Uh, the D attribute, uh, which is also known as the path data, is a string of letters and numbers that represent uh, commands for the computer to follow when drawing the shape. Uh, the path data typically dominates the SVG file. It's usually the longest. And therefore, it's compressed as much as possible. Uh, commands are one letter long. Uh, white spaces and commas are omitted whenever possible. Uh, so the example on the screen right now uh, can be further compressed by removing the commas and the spaces after the M and the Ls. Uh, a path can also uh, contain uh, multiple segments, which is useful when you want to kind of compress the file even smaller. Uh, there is a fill and a stroke attributes, which are used to set the colors of the shape. And the fill rule is used to determine how you uh, fill the shape and will get back to that because it's quite important. Uh, so here's kind of the basic instructions. Uh, instructions always start with a letter followed by zero or more parameters. Uh, instructions can either be lowercase or uppercase. Uh, the difference being that uppercase instructions use um, absolute coordinates while lowercase mean relative coordinates. Um, so as you follow the instructions, a nice analogy uh, to use to, to keep in mind is it's as if you're drawing using a pen to draw on paper, where the current point uh, is the where the pen is touching the paper. Um, so every path has to start with the move to command, uh, and this basically establishes a new current point. Uh, the effect is as if the pen was lifted and moved to a new location. Um, Okay, the next command uh, is the line to command, uh, which is just a simple instruction to draw a line. Uh, so there's two variants to this command, uh, one to, for drawing horizontal lines, one for vertical, uh, and that's just so you can save one character. Uh, the next command is the curve to, which draws uh, a Bezier curve from the current, po the current point uh, to xy using xy1, y1, 
as the control point at the beginning of the curve and x2, y2 as the control point at the end of the curve. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. The S instruction is a uh, shorthand for the C, the curve instruction, where the first control point is assumed to be a mirror of the second control point. There's also uh, Q and T commands that are used to draw quadratic Bezier curves, and an A command is used to draw elliptical arcs. Uh, and then the last useful command is the uh, close, close path command, which just draws a straight line from the current position to the end. To the, sorry, from the current position to the start position of the path. Uh, the stroke command defines the color of the path, while the stroke width defines the width of the path. And the fill attribute describes the color used to fill the shape that the path is basically describing. Uh, and then there's the fill rule, which describes the strategy how uh, used to fill the shape. And again, we'll come back to this in just a little bit. Um, okay, so vector drawables are Android's version of the SVG format. It's a very small but a very powerful subset of the SVG spec. And most importantly, it uses a different syntax that is more familiar for Android developers. Uh, so again, vector drawables also use a uh, coordinate system. Uh, it uses the uh, viewport width and viewport height, uh, which are equivalent to SVG's view box property. However, you only specify the width and height and not start and end points. Uh, and then there's width and height, uh, which are the intrinsic width and height of the drawable. And that's used to generate uh, PNGs for supporting pre-Lollipop devices. Um, the path element is Android's version of the SVG path. Um, and as you can see, these are very similar to what SVG has. Path data is the same as the D attribute. Fill color, stroke color, and stroke width are all very self-explanatory. Uh, so this is what a vector drawable looks like. Uh, this particular one draws a circle with a check mark in its center. Uh, the top level element is the vector, and it has the width, height, and the viewport uh, width and height. Um, and then inside the vector element, we have two pass uh, elements. And I just want to point out that the, um, the, the path has a name attribute, and that becomes useful when you want to animate the path. But it's also useful because it's not really obvious from the path data what it's actually drawing. And then uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is that the order of the path does matter um, for the uh, Z index, uh, or the final Z index of the path. So in this case, the check mark is drawn on top of the circle and not vice versa. Okay, so how do we actually make these? Uh, turns out it's very easy. Android Studio has a handy tool to create vector drawables for you. Uh, so it lets you pick from hundreds of material style icons or it lets you import your, your own. So let's say you get this SVG from a designer or somewhere from the internet and you try to import it uh, through Studio and for some reason you get this. And you're left kind of confused asking yourself, uh, why does the SVG have a hole in the middle but the vector drawable doesn't? Wasn't it supposed to be the same? Uh, so, and this happened to me multiple times, so I had to dig and find out why. Uh, it turns out the problem is the strategy used to fill the shape. Uh, SVG is using something called the even odd rule, fill rule, and it turns out that Android only started supporting that in API 24. Uh, so does that mean we're out of luck and we have to go back to JPEGs and PNGs? The answer is no, because there is a solution. And you can use MinSDK 24. <laughs> <laughs> which means you'll target about 95% of users in this room. <laughs> I, have, I have two real solutions for you. Uh, so let's start with the hard one. Uh, we need to convert the even odd fill to a non-zero fill, uh, which is the rule that Android actually supports. But before we need to do that, we have to understand what these are. So in order to understand how we decide how to fill a pixel, whether it is filled or it's not, we draw a ray from any pixel towards infinity. And the direction doesn't matter. It should always work out the same. Uh, so we draw a ray, and then we count how many times that ray 
crosses a path. And if the path crosses from the left side to the right side, we increase the count by one. And if it uh, crosses from the left to the right, we decrease by one. So in this first path, uh, first ray, we uh, cross two, ray, two paths going from left to right. Therefore, our total is two. Now, when the, in the even out rule, if our total is even, then we don't fill the pixel. Then the, the pixel remains transparent. And when the total is odd, the pixel gets filled. Therefore, it's colored. So if we do that for a different pixel, uh, and we count again, uh, first we cross a path going from the right to the left. So we subtract one. And then we cross two paths going from left to right. Uh, so we increase by two. So our total is one, it's odd, and therefore we fill that pixel in. So what does the non-zero rule look like? Well, it's very similar. You do the same thing, but now if you get a non-zero value, you fill the circle, you have that pixel. And if you get a zero, you don't fill it. So in both of our uh, pixels that we picked before, we get one and two. Therefore, they're both filled. So how do we actually fix this? Well, it turns out that it's not too complicated. You take one of the paths and you reverse its direction. Uh, and this is something you can do in Sketch and in Illustrator and whatever design software you use. Um, so we do that. We count the paths we cross. And we get uh, zero for the pixels in the middle. Uh, therefore, we don't fill it. So that's the hard solution. What's the easy one? We use the support library. Uh, if you use support library version 25.4 and newer, it adds support for the even out rule, uh, as well as backporting animated vector drawables all the way back to Ice Cream Sandwich. And speaking of animated vector, vector drawables, um, animated vector drawables allowed you to take vector drawables and make them animatable. And what that means is that you can assign each element uh, or each path or a group of path a unique name, and then the animated vector drawable can map that to, uh, to object animators. Um, so this is what an animated vector drawable looks like. It's just a simple XML resource file that you place inside your vector directory, your drawable directory, excuse me. Uh, you start with just an animated vector object, uh, and you pass that your vector drawable resource. That will be used as the start state of the animation. And then you give it uh, one or more mappings from a path or a group to an animation. Well, not very complicated, but what can we actually animate? So it turns out that a lot. Uh, there is some basic things you can animate, like changing colors, uh, animating the stroke width, uh, the transparency. Uh, but there are more kind of advanced and more interesting animations that I'd like to show you. Uh, so the first and easiest is transformations. Uh, and these are animations you apply to a group of one or more paths. Uh, and you animate them as kind of as a unit uh, without totally changing the, the shape of the path. Uh, so let's say you start with this simple arrow that you want to flip. Um, it doesn't matter really where you get it from, but you, you want to make it more interesting. You want to give it kind of more of a, you want to give it more like an interesting, you want to give it life. Um, so what you can do is you can break the two parts of the arrow into two separate paths, and then you can animate them separately uh, what, and at the same time. So in this animation, we rotate around the center point, and we transform with a little bit of delay uh, back into the, where it's supposed to end up. Uh, and it's a little easier to see when the pads have different colors. And I know that the colors are flipping position, because uh, I kind of screwed it up. But <laughs> um, yeah, it just gives it a little bit more of a meaningful uh, animation and like that it conveys the meaning of what, what is happening on the screen. Um, another very powerful property of paths is the ability to uh, trim them. 
uh, before they appear on the display, before they are actually drawn. Uh, and this, by, this gives you the ability to really create some nice effects. So you can trim uh, the path either at the start, at the end, uh, and you can also offset the trim position. Uh, and the unit for this is uh, like percentage between zero and one. So let's say we start with just a simple line. Um, you can trim the first 20% out, uh, you can trim the last 20%, and you can also offset the whole thing. Uh, and by animating these three properties, you can make really nice effects. Um, so you can recreate the uh, material design progress bars this way. Um, the horizontal progress bar has two paths that are animating on a visible track, while the circular progress bar is uh, having its start, end, and offset trims all animating uh, at the same time, while the entire group is rotated. Uh, and this is also how the fingerprint animation was done from before. Uh, there's five paths uh, that are used as kind of the tracks, and another five paths that are used, uh, that are being kind of filled in by animating the uh, trim path and attribute, just from zero to one. Uh, the next set of animations I want to show is the path morphing. And this is the coolest and most powerful animation uh, that you can do uh, with animated vector drawables, but it's also one of the hardest ones to implement. Um, and that's because paths have to be compatible. And what does it mean for paths to be compatible? Uh, it, it means that uh, the first path and the second path must have the same number of uh, comments. Uh, it also means that the nth drawing command uh, in the first path must have the same type as the nth drawing command in the second path for all n. And it means that the nth drawing command in the first path must also have the same number of parameters as the nth drawing command in the second path for all n. Uh, so that's not really easy to achieve. Um, but let's go through an example. Let's say you want to animate this minus sign to a plus sign. Uh, first, we need to determine if the paths are compatible. So we iterate through the commands. We see that the first command is good. The second, in order to get to the second point in the minus path, we need to go through five commands in the plus path. So obviously not compatible. Uh, and then we go through, again, the next command is fine. And then you have, uh, again, you have to go through five commands to get to the next point in the minus path. So in order to fix this, we have to, um, we have to add commands to the minus path that don't alter the visual shape of the final path, but allow us to morph it uh, when we want to. So we add these five commands, or the, the missing four commands, to the minus path, and we do that in the, um, the other side of the path. Uh, so we get, um, we get the final path that looks exactly like this, the minus sign we started with, but actually has these extra control points that we can then use to animate. And what this actually looks like is this pretty smooth animation that goes from minus to plus. And we can use the same technique to create much more complex animations. Um, the circles to lines, um, as Nick showed in his previous presentation, uh, you just use uh, control points that are equal to your start and end points, uh, and then a curve is drawn exactly like a line. Uh, and then you can use this technique to create some crazy animations. Uh, and this animation, I used a tool called Shapeshifter, which uh, does all the hard work of figuring out uh, where the missing paths, uh, missing commands are, and where they should go. Um, and you should really use it, it's an awesome tool. Um, and then the last animation type that I wanted to discuss uh, is path clipping. Uh, and path clipping is a type of path, or a path clip is a type of path that's used to mask uh, and restrict the region to which other paths can be drawn to. So anything that lies outside the region bounded by a clip path will not be drawn to the screen. Uh, and by animating the, the region, these regions, you can create some cool effects like this eye uh, with a slash going through it. 
Uh, and this is kind of hard to explain, so let me just go through an example of how this was created. Uh, so you start with this eye icon, uh, and we want to generate a mask that will restrict to basically this end clipped area. Uh, so this is the clips that would uh, that would restrict the the, the path the way we want it to show. Uh, if you, we start in the first image and we animate uh, this diagonal area, uh, it gives us this desired slash going through it effect. Uh, and by applying a simple path morph animation, we can animate this change. Uh, all right, so we have a way to go from this icon to this icon. But what we really want is this slash in the middle. So how do we... Um, how do we, the, the slash is clearly in, inside or outside the clipping path. So how do we actually draw that uh, outside of the mask? Well, it turns out that clipping path uh, or path clipping only operates on siblings within the same group. So by, play, by structuring our vector drawable uh, such that the strike happens outside or is not a sibling of the mask, we're able to draw the strike through uh, outside the masked area. And that gives us this final effect um, where we animate uh, the mask and this, um, the, the strike through at the same time. And then the last thing I want to show is kind of how you actually start this. And it's um, ve animated vector drawables are actually uh, animatables, meaning that they have uh, start and end instructions or um, methods. And starting in version 24, they also have listeners, so you can listen to when it ends uh, and react to that. Uh, and you're also able to use animated selectors, which let you define uh, like start and end vector drawables and define transitions uh, between the states. Uh, and here's some useful resources. Uh, Shapeshifter is an awesome tool you should all use. Um, this article uh, about number twinning and this video that explains uh, Bezier curves um, in like a visual way that's like eye popping uh, and how simple it is. All right, thank you very much. And um, there's uh,